If you can, yeah, speak louder, um, loudly. Satish, you talked about reskilling. Yeah. The problem um, that our children are growing up without any skills. Yeah. So that uh, all the basic uh, needs that we have to make pottery, furniture, building, grow food, and all that, our children don't have it. Yeah. Um, I'm very concerned about this too, yeah. and uh, have been. Uh, my wife and I started the transition group here um, about seven years ago, I think. Yeah. And that was one of the, the key things that we wanted to do, yeah. is to try and get, um, we call it skilling up for yeah. power down. Yeah. So that the, the less uh, energy that we have um, brought in from outside, the more we learn to do things for ourselves. <coughs> It hasn't worked, um, people aren't doing it, um, because there's no perceived need now. Mm. So my question to you, Satish, is at what point do people perceive the need? When do you think this will come and what do we do to prepare in advance <coughs> for the need when it comes? Because if we wait till that point, it'll be too late, but if we try and do it before, the lack of a perceived need prevents it from happening. Yes. Um, first of all, we have to change our thinking and mind. Uh, need is not only the utility that we use something. There are psychological needs and spiritual needs and artistic needs. Being engaged in making something, creating something, fulfills another kind of need, which is not a perceived need, but another kind of need, which is need of fulfillment, of being joyful and happy. When you make something, you feel, I, I made it. This is a kind of transformative power of the arts and crafts. When you take a piece of clay, it has very little value in money terms, although it's soil, it's mother nature, but uh, we don't, it's just nothing. But you turn that into a beautiful pot, like Bernard Leach or somebody, uh, and that pot now is a bowl for your soup, a bowl on your table, and it has a work of art, and it's an artist is in it, and, and you value it, and you, you respect it. So that is a kind of, it's a different kind of need which we don't think that we do need, but this spiritual fulfillment that you get from making something and transforming clay into a pot. And when you have transformed clay into a pot, you have transformed yourself. Who was Bernard Leach? Who knew Bernard Leach before he made a pot? The moment he made a pot and became a Bernard Leach, he transformed himself by becoming a potter. So transformative power and transformative quality which you transforms you and you transform it. You become an alchemist. Now this thinking has to be brought back. Before we can ask people to make something for their need, because everything is made by machines, so you don't really need. But when you make something for your imaginative and spiritual needs, and your poetic needs, and your, your artistic needs, and, and, and this relationship with the clay, or with wood, or with, uh, with um, stone, or whatever it is, that relationship. And I think this, we need to bring a new kind of education. I think in your transition town, and congratulations for Louis, very famous, um, we, we know that you have created transition town here. Wonderful. Now you need to create a, an alternative educational program every month somewhere, or every week even, or every month at least, have this new program of re-educating our adults and our parents, our children, and say how we can create, and create workshops where some uh, potter, some uh, furniture maker, some builders can teach actual skills. It will require some funding maybe, but create workshops. So you have to have parallel um, system, in, in parallel to educational system, because schools are not going to do it. So transition town movement should create parallel education where you have talks, lectures, and videos, and, and, uh, and a, a discussion, and conversation, where we bring these values back into our consciousness. Unless we change our mind, we are not going to change our action. So we have to think about these things and create a program of education. 
adult education, children's education, um, intellectually, spiritually, and also parallel workshops. And you say, here's a workshop, come and learn. Young children, when you have finished your school, come in the evenings, especially this, um, long evenings in, in the summer. Come and we'll teach you some practical skills. We'll teach you gardening. We'll teach you cooking. We'll teach you pottery. We'll teach you woodwork. We'll teach you repairing, mending, uh, clothes, anything. Create those workshops. That'll be a great transition town movement. If you just hope that, what do we do? We, we hope. Hope is good. Hope is necessary. Hope is the first step. But then you have to bring that into action. So I'll suggest two ideas. One is a weekly or a monthly program of um, ex exploration and education and conversation with people of Lewis. And a second program, workshops, where um, skilled potters, skilled craftspeople can teach those things. And then, and you know, you have to start somewhere. Seed is small. The small is beautiful, but out of that seed will grow a big tree. So don't think that tomorrow uh, the seed will become a tree. Seed will be sown, so you have to sow the seed, you have to uh, encourage people, you have to invite people, persist on it. Things won't happen in one day or one week. It will take a month or a year or two years or five years. I've been running the small school for 31 years. 1982 I started. And so Smarter College has been going for 21 years. So start something and it will happen. So that's all I can suggest. Another question. Yes, yes please. This is also about youth. <laughs> Sorry? Also about youth and young people. Yeah. And I also knew Fritz Schumacher. Um, in spite of the disapproval of some of my very good friends here, I attended the Earth Summit in Rio. Yeah. And what I saw was this. Firstly, the indigenous people from all over the Americas and the rest of the world, and represented in many ways by Via Campesina, doing their thing and saying, our time has come. Hmm. And on the last day, the representative for youth, who was allowed to speak in the plenary, was refused. And hmm. she came back and she gave a passionate speech saying to the politicians, you have failed us, we will make a new world. Mm. And the this was 92. What? No, no, 92? No, no, last year. This year, OK. Yeah, the, 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 mm. I, I'm that old, but last year, this year, yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, Rio and plus the, 20, yeah. Uh, and, there was, and, and there were 500 hardened campaigners in that room, and they all were in tears and clapping. Mm. And what do you see? Do you, you've said what the youth needs, but do you see the hope in the youth and in the indigenous people? I, I do, I do. I see great hope. And even today, uh, when I was having tea with Peter, a uh, couple of young people came, and I said um, that we need um, uh, we need young people like you. And I said, if you won't lead it, who will lead it? I was talking to one 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 of the two young people, and uh, I said, if you won't lead it, who will lead it? So you be the leader, young leader. And then, when I asked, if you won't lead it, who will lead it? It was a, a boy of 11 or 12, he said, I will lead him. <laughs> I was very touched. So I feel that there is a great potential and hope among our children and young people. Do not give up hope. Give them freedom. Give them trust. Give them faith. Give them uh, encouragement. And, and uh, be mentor. But encourage them to find their own way. And I think now, even, even at this difficult time, Change is possible. We have to have that hope. And, and young people can lead it. So we can give our, our encouragement and support to young people and indigenous people, particularly indigenous young people. I think we can do it. So um, I go to schools and universities and, and talk to young people and say, be the leader. And now I'm also saying environmental movement also needs to uh, come together. Uh, at the moment, environmental movement is very fragmented. All these different, different organizations and a lot of negative um, kind of news. I think we need to have, you can have organizations separate, but movement should be one. We are all emphasizing one aspect, another aspect, another aspect, but there are aspects of one big picture. Whether you are National Trust or WWF or Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth or CPRE or whatever organization you belong to. But we are trying to build a beautiful and sustainable future for the entire country. 
And in that we are one movement. And all organizations like different families, uh, separate families, but you can live, um, one son can live somewhere, and one daughter can live somewhere, and parents can live somewhere, but they come together as a family. So in the same way, the environmental movement needs to come together as a family and have no internal jealousies. So young people and environmental movement collaborating together can give a new future. Yes, so, please. do you remember the conversation we had in Whitechapel about the crystal? We have facets, not yeah. factions. We yeah. all facets. Of facets, one. yeah, exactly. Facets, exactly. not factions. Yeah, yeah. Facets, not factions. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is good, good uh, simile. Yes, yes, please. Yes, you. It's on a similar note, the, the aid movement, the UK international development aid industry. What, what are your views on that? Because it's had quite mixed results global poverty and, and all the different organizations that exist, what, what do you, what's your message to the AIDS <clears throat> movement? My message to, and I work a little bit with Oxfam, and uh, my message to them always <laughs> are two folds. One is uh, that do not try to treat symptoms, try to treat the cause. What is the cause of poverty? Poor are poor not because they are stupid. Poor are poor not because they don't know how to grow food, how to build a house, how to make furniture. They do it. But they are poor because of injustice. They are not paid properly. If you are working on the land, you get 100 pounds a day, even in England. If you work in a bank, you get 10,000 pounds a day. Why? Is Fiddling with figures on a computer more valuable than growing food? You are not going to eat computers or, or, or money, you will eat food. So bankers should be paid maybe 100 pounds a day and a farmer 10,000 pounds a day. So aid is a matter of justice and not a charity. And that's what I say to Ox Oxfam people and my other aid fellows. And I was also meeting with Rowan Williams, now former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams. He has become the chairman of uh, Christian Aid. And I had a meeting with him, and I said the same thing to him. I think it is very important that the aid agencies don't just do a patchwork or a band-aid work, 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 and so give some aid here and there. Address the question of causes of poverty. Cause, I was even, I mean, this rally, Bill Clinton, not Bill, Bill Gates was talking, and, uh, and same thing. They said, send more injections, send more vaccinations, send more this from Western countries. I said, how long can you go on doing it? What is the cause of those problems that Africa and, and Asian countries are facing? Unless you address the cause, aid is not enough. And that's why I work with Oxfam and try to give them. The second thing I say, that in, uh, uh, social justice, and social justice uh, is a development and environmental justice are like two wings of one bird. You cannot separate social justice from the environmental justice. Because even if you have everybody is rich and no poverty, and still if you explore the land and environment and cut down rainforest and pollute your rivers and pollute your oceans, there will not be enough. Uh, for the um, aid agencies. So I say Oxfam and, and aid agencies like Oxfam and the environmental movement should work together and see two as a two sides of the same coin, two wings of one bird. And that way we can have a bigger picture rather than just <coughs> one, uh, one single issue development. And so that's two things I say always. And, so, and um, I went to Hay Festival on behalf of Oxfam and spoke there, these sort of ideas. So environment and environmental justice and society and social justice, those two together make the aid uh, agencies right. Excuse me, sir. Yes. I'm so sorry. Well, here and then you're there. Yeah. Um, my question's less profound, I'm afraid, but I'm very interested in the detail of your walk. What was the highest point for you on the walk and what was your lowest point? <laughs> Uh, actually, the highest point and lowest point came more or less on the same day. <laughs> First, the lowest point. Uh, we walked through um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Armenia, Georgia, 
And by the time we were in Georgia by the Black Sea, I was feeling very tired. <laughs> and sometimes you don't get food. Although I normally said to myself that when we don't get food, we will say, this is our opportunity to fast. <laughs> and if we don't get shelter to sleep, we'll say, tonight we are going to sleep under a million star hotel. <laughs> Not a four star or five star or three star hotel, but a million star hotel. <laughs> Nevertheless, one day I said to my friend, are we achieving anything? Is it worth doing it? Although we're getting a lot of publicity and we met Shah of Iran and we got into newspapers and radio and television, all that we're getting publicity. Still, I said to my friend, I said, yes, yes, sir, we, we must remain determined. He was, he was strong. And it was very interesting dynamics. When I felt any time, Low, my friend will feel high. When he felt a bit low, I will feel high. So we were good balance to each other. But during that day when I was feeling low and I was always distributing leaflets to people about the walk and why we are walking and why we are not carrying any money and why it is important to have a nuclear disarmament, all that. So I gave this flyer to two Russian women who were standing in front of a tea factory. And I, when they read it, they said, oh, you have walked all the way from India. How did you do it? And so they said, we'd like a cup of tea. We'd like to hear your stories. And so we said, all right, we'll have tea. Anytime is tea time, especially if you have no money. <laughs> so we went in, it's a tea factory, a little canteen. And at lunchtime, people were on sort of uh, lunch break. And so as we were drinking tea, one of the two women had a brainwave. She went out of the room and came back with four packets of tea. <laughs> and she said to us that these four packets are packets of peace tea. <laughs> and I would, they are not for you. I would like you to deliver one packet to our premier in Moscow, in the Kremlin. Second, to the president of France in Palace <laughs> Elysee. Third, to 10 Downing Street. And fourth, to the President of the United States of America in the White House. And please give them a message from me. And I said, what is your message? He said, my message to them is that if you ever get a mad thought of pressing the nuclear button, please stop for a moment and have a fresh cup of tea. <laughs> and when I heard that, that was my highest point. And I said, look, now we are messenger of this wonderful mother, young mother, and she is in this village, small village, what a wisdom. Nobody would expect that she, in the working in a tea factory, will come up with this wonderful idea. Peace tea for these four nuclear capitals and no, for, for uh, uh, nuclear leaders. And so that was, and then we delivered um, those packets of tea and, uh, and the story in my book. No destination is the story book which you can see with the whole story of my walk and so I have an idea now <laughs> my idea is I'm proposing to BBC and they know me because I made a film for them called Earth Pilgrim I'm proposing to BBC that next year is the centenary commemoration of the first world war I would like to go back to the Kremlin and meet Putin and Palace Elysee and meet Hollande and meet um, uh, David Cameron and meet Obama and have a cup of tea with them. Yeah. <laughs> and say, uh, the film should be called Make Tea Not War. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I will ask them that this is the 100th anniversary commemoration of First World War. What do you think of the 100 years? How, because that was the war to end all wars. Mm -hmm. What have we done? And how can we do the next hundred years without any war? What is your policy? So we have a conversation and that can be shown on BBC. Mm -hmm. So let us see what they say. But this is my proposal. <laughs> Sorry, you're on such a high and I feel I'm bringing you down a bit. No, 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 please, please. Um, what about the overpopulation? Uh, that we have at the moment where we have children having children and it's uh, starving to death, you know, the, the hunger yes, thing. Yes. Is there any way that we can address this where it's maybe just two 
with children, her family, or, yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to bring you down with this. No, 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 no. It's a good question, very important question. And uh, particularly in the context of the environmental sustainability and our rising population, we need to address it. And I think it can only be addressed through education, cultural change, mind change. And we need to have a massive, big, effective educational program to educate our young, um, aspiring parents to say one, maybe two, one, maybe two, but no more. That kind of education is very important. And then the second point we also need to address ourselves, that even if you have only small population, and which is already very big, our consumption should be less. Because if you consume, 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 even one person can bring a devastation to the environment. So our consumption pattern should go down and our number should go down. These two together can address the question. I'm delighted to see your little baby uh, on your on your bosoms and on your on your chest. That's wonderful to see. Thank you, wonderful mother. Congratulations. Um, <clears throat> motherhood is a very important uh, thing. I have two children. Fatherhood is also important, and my daughter has a, a, a little baby, and so I'm a grandfather, and um, and uh, uh, and my daughter is being very good mother as well. So my practice in bringing up two children, and the same thing I say to other uh, young mothers, is that give your children your love, but give them also freedom. When children grow up freedom, in freedom, they will grow stronger. And even if they make mistakes, they should learn from mistakes they will learn from mistake. If you give them too much protection and don't allow them to make mistakes, they will not grow so resilient, so strong, so confident. And so giving them freedom and taking risk of them making some mistake is better than giving over protection. So this is how I brought up my two children. And, uh, and I'm delighted to say that they are doing very happy, they are very happy, and both of them are very, uh, I'm very happy with them. <laughs> and uh, and uh, my daughter is the same now. She is bringing up her child in, in a similar way, and she's being very good mother. And so uh, when my children will climb walls, and some friends will go, oh, well, you, Mukti is on the walls, he might fall down. I said, if he falls down, he will learn not to climb again. <laughs> and so I think children need to become resilient and strong. And if they make mistake, not a problem. Of course, you have to protect from the fire or little children going too close to fire or going into some, something where it's, it's lethal or something very dangerous. That kind of protection is needed. But in normal life, you must allow children to make mistake. Yes? 